Hi, welcome to Into ETV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is John J. Davis, and he is going to give us a guided tour through heaven because that is exactly how his near death experience played out to him. And it is such an honor to be able to have you on here and share this because I know you've shared it before, but I just love it when, you know, I'm, I'm so used to just watching these things. You probably do too, just sit and watch and yep. into ease, but then when you can actually like face to face somebody and, and get, get right in there. I love it. I, I love doing these. So thank you so much for inviting me onto your show. I so appreciate that. And I, so I, I am, I'm so thrilled when people take an interest in my story. For me, it's like, it's no big deal. But when I tell people for the first time, it's like you really did have something that was really unique. And yes. sometimes I forget that when when people hear it the first time, just like when I saw it the first time, I was absolutely blown away that everything I saw was actually real and there is an other side and we never die. We go on for eternity and we're yeah. just here for a short while. So and, thank and you we for hear these me stories. On. I'm sorry. Yeah. I just said, thank you for inviting me on. Oh, thank you for coming. Cause we hear these stories, but I'll be honest. Um, my husband got a bad diagnosis shockingly a couple weeks ago. And even though I hear NDEs and talk about NDEs and I had a few days where I was mad at God, you know, I mean, it's different to be on one side of a issue than the other, you know? Oh yeah. And I forgot about the part where we miss the people, even though they're on the other side and it's beautiful. The people left behind, we're going to miss them horribly. And yours, I watched yours because I knew you was coming on. So I'll see what he's about. And it did it for me. It, it did something for me. It oh, gave good. me my faith back is not that I completely lost it, you know, yeah. but to what, my husband is going to see step by step by step. I mean, because we can see a little bit, we can get glimpses through these NDEs. Sure. You know, and everybody hears something different, sees something different, but yours, you just, you just walk us through it. So I'm just going to, I'm going to let you take the floor if that's okay. okay. And just let sure. you tell the audience and sure, I'm going to put sure. you on full view here. No problem. Well, this, my story happened when I was 21 and I'll, I'll just tell you from the beginning I was out riding a moped oh, or what would you call a scooter now? And I was making a right turn and in the middle of the road, there was a squirrel. So I went to turn to avoid the squirrel and he ran the same direction I turned. So I turned the opposite direction and I crashed into a tree and I hit pretty hard. And it was hard enough that I tore tendons off my hand and I had to have surgery to have those reattached. Well, I had never had surgery before. And so I go into the hospital and it turns out that when they gave me the anesthesia, I had an allergic reaction and my heart stopped and I was clinically dead for seven minutes. And during that seven minute period is when I had this experience on the other side or what, what some people call heaven or the afterlife. And it was so unbelievable. I didn't know what it, what happened for about a day and a half to two days after I came back. When I was there for seven minutes, it felt like I was there for an hour because they don't have time like we do. Time is different for them. So for me, when I was there, I, I couldn't believe that I was only there for seven minutes, that they showed me everything that they showed me in that length of time. So let me, let me tell you what happened. Um, so when I died, it seemed like it was an instant later that I opened up my eyes and I was standing in the most beautiful building I've ever seen. It was made of marble, beautiful, white, pristine, perfect marble. And the first thought that I had was I had no idea the hospital was this large because this building, it was so long that I couldn't see the end of it. And from this point on, what started happening, and I, and I didn't know any of this at the time, I only found this out later, but we have spirit guides 
all of us have spirit guides that help us through our lifetimes. And I was with my guide during this near-death experience. So everything he showed me and took me to, he told me in my left ear, I could hear him in my left ear, what I was seeing, what it was, and all the people that I saw. So he was talking to me this whole time. Well, this building, it was a long corridor, the first building that I saw. And again, is as far as you could see, it looked like it went on for miles. On the right-hand side of this building were beautiful, ornate marble columns all the way down as far as you could see. And they were, they were probably 20 or 30 feet high, just gorgeous. To the left of these columns, there were tables. Again, white marble tables with benches on each side of the table, all four benches. And these tables also went down as far as you could see. And at these tables were two people. Each table had two people. And I was told that they're counselors. And I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. To the left of these tables was something that was absolutely breathtaking. There were these tunnels, tunnels or doorways. And it looked like they were cut right out of the marble, perfect rectangular cuts, just like a doorway, just like a door looks. But there was no, they were, there was no door on there. It was just a, like, a, like a tunnel. And my guide said, go look inside one of those tunnels. So I walked over and, I, and, and when you first look at the tunnel, it looks like it's just blackness, just dark. So I looked in. And what I could see were stars and planets and galaxies it was absolutely beautiful. And my guide told me that this, these tunnels are how people get from earth when they finish their lives back to the other side. And again, I had no idea what was going on at the time. So I just went along with everything. And he told me to look up at the next tunnel. So I looked up and there was a gentleman, an older man who was coming through that tunnel. And I wanna back up a little bit to describe the significance of what this meant. And again, I didn't know till years later, but you know how a lot of people who have NDEs say that they get out of their body, they'll see themselves looking down, they'll, they'll see the accident scene or they'll see themselves in the hospital. Yes. Then they see the tunnel and they go through the tunnel and they see the white light at the end. Yeah. I didn't have any of that. What they did is I was transported directly to the other side of that light. So when people see the white light, when they walk into it, they walk into the building that I was in and it's called an orientation center. So going back now, this, this gentleman walked in or walked through the tunnel and stepped onto the orientation center marble floor. And he had his right hand on his chest. And my guide said he died from a heart attack. So he was holding his chest. And that very moment when he walked through, this woman, one of the counselors, she stood up. She walked over and she took her hands in his and she walked him back over to the table and sat him down. Come to find out from my guide that these counselors are called orientation counselors. Their job is to let people know that they just finished a lifetime and you did a fantastic job, you're back now. You're here back on the real, in the real world, the real home, because when you come into a lifetime, somehow, I don't know how this works, but when you come into a lifetime, you have amnesia. You don't remember really anything about where we come from. And that's all designed intentionally so that we can accomplish what we set out to accomplish when we come in. So the counselor's job is just to let people know you're back. What happened is my guide said, watch him carefully. So I was watching him 
and I was watching this counselor talk to him, but I was too far away to hear what she was saying. I could just see her mouth moving, talking to him. Well, what happened is as I was watching him, and, and he was probably, when he crossed over, he was an elderly man, maybe in his 80s or 90s. He was, he was older. And right in front of my eyes, he began to change. His whole body began to change and get young, just like he was 30 years old. I come to find out that everybody on the other side is in their 30s. Again, I don't know why that is. Maybe that's because Jesus was 30. When he started when he was 30. I don't know, but everybody is young on the other side. And that's our true state. That's our real body. Well, so after her job is to explain to these new, the, the people who come from these tunnels, where they came from, they came from earth, their life is finished, they're back home. Well, as soon as he changed back to where he was and he was orientated back to where, where he came from, he stood up, he walked off to the right, and he walked down three steps between these marble columns into these gardens that I, I can't even, to this day, I, I can't even describe how beautiful they were. If you, if you can picture the most perfect English garden, perfectly manicured, perfect grass, trees, flowers, I mean, absolutely gorgeous. But what happens is when people go through orientation and they finish orientation, they walk out to these gardens and they have what's called a reunion. And everybody that passed before that person, whether it was their parents, siblings, children, aunts, uncles, grandparents, and people that they already knew on the other side before they came in, all of them um, congregate waiting for that person to come through orientation and they have a big reunion. And it's, it was absolutely beautiful to watch this. Everyone was smiling. Everyone was hugging this man, telling him what a great job he did. And I found out that coming to earth is a really big deal. There are many, many souls who don't want to come here because it's so hard. So when we finish a lifetime here, everything we go through, it's a really big deal. So everybody has an orientation and they meet with everyone that they, they loved and missed and who went before them. And then I've got my notes so I don't forget anything. Once they have the orientation, they take them to what's called a life review building. I don't know, have you heard that term before, life review? Yes. Okay, it's, like they're, it's actually real. They're, they really do have them. And what, it, what, what I saw, it was a, a building and my guide took me to the outs. Every time he took me someplace, he took me to the outside of this building first so I could see what it looked like. And this, this building was long, again, marbles. So many of the buildings in the place that I was in had marble columns. They were like, Greek buildings, Romanesque type of buildings. They're just beautiful white marble, just gorgeous. So I walked in and there was, it was like walking into a modern movie theater for us. But instead of having one screen, this building had tons. It was like in a big circle. If you can picture um, movie screens in a circle in this building. And what it was is that's where you go to review your life. And all of a sudden, every single one of those screens came on and it was showing a different part of my life. And at the time I was only 21. So it didn't show me anything past 21, but it showed me life when I was a little infant, life when I started elementary school, um, junior high, high school, going to college, it, and it, it shows all these different aspects of your life. And what I, what I still don't understand to this day is how that's possible, because everything that we go through, everything we experience, even as detailed as a conversation, it gets recorded. Somehow, God has the ability 
to record all of our lifetimes. And I don't know how that works, but you can see, you can go back and look at any specific point of your life and look at every little detail. So everyone goes through a life review to see how they did. And okay, the, okay, the next building. So once I saw my life review up to that point, I went to, he took me to another building. Again, it looked Romanesque with the columns. It was rectangle and square. And there were rooms in here. And each room, again, looked like a movie theater. But this one only had one screen up in the, up in the top or up in the beginning of, of the building. And it started playing. And what my guide said was, we're going to show you past lifetimes. And all of this... At this point, I didn't really know what was going on. I was raised a Catholic. So my Catholic upbringing was starting to now conflict with what I was hearing. I thought, what's going on here? I, I, how can this be real? I'm, none of this is real. But it turned out everything was real. So the movie turned on. And the first thing that was on the film was a man in a monastery he was bald in his 50s with a red gown. And it turned out that was me. And you don't look like yourself because you you're the product of DNA, genes, all of that that are in each particular lifetime. But I knew it was me. And I was having a lifetime as a monk. And my job was to teach the kids about life in the monastery. It was absolutely incredible. Then he showed me another one. Another, another one came up on the screen, and it was of a fisherman. I had a little boat, and I had a net that I would toss into the water and fish. My job was to fish for, um, for our little community, our town. And the last lifetime he showed me was one of, of, a, of a shoe peddler. So I had a wheelbarrow, and I was pushing shoes down this street, it was like it was like watching a video, just like you watch a movie. And my job in that community was to fix people's shoes. So in that town, I would fix their shoes, put them in the wheelbarrow, and carry them down to where they lived. So he showed me three past lifetimes. The next thing he took me to, and this was probably <clears throat> the most beautiful of all the buildings. It was, it looked like a stadium from the outside. It looked like a sports arena and it, it would, it would sit thousands, thousands of people, even, even larger than the Roman Colosseum. I would say there easily 80,000 people could fit in this building. So he showed me the outside. Then he took me inside and it was lined with thousands of seats and nobody was there except for me. <clears throat> Well, as soon as my guide had me go in there, there was a someone behind me who was like the person that worked the controls. And what this place was, was a planetarium. You know, when you go into a planetarium, you sit and you look up at the ceiling and they show stars and all those things. Yeah. That's what this building was. And there was a person who was behind me and it was a male. And he said to me, let's begin. So I sat down and all the lights went out. It was pitch black. And all of a sudden, the, the guy behind me said, when you look at the stars, meaning everybody on earth, not just me, but when you look at the stars, this is what you see. And up on the ceiling, he started showing our solar system, you know, our sun, Mercury, Mars, Venus, Saturn. Jupiter, they all started showing up. And then he said, and that, that disappeared. And then he said, when we look at the stars, meaning people on the other side, this is what we see. And all of a sudden, planet after planet started showing up. Hundreds, then thousands, and millions of planets on the screen. Some were blue, some were red, some were brown, some were green. And he said to me, there's more life in the universe than you can possibly imagine. And what I got from that 
And it's it, somehow you just, you just know when you're there, you get this information. We can have multiple lifetimes on many other planets. There are millions of planets that we can go to. And that's when my guide said, this one is the hardest of them all, life on earth. That's why there are so many that don't wanna come here. So when people do come here and they survive their life and they learn what they came to learn, that's why it's such a big deal because this place is so hard. So that was the stadium. Okay, here's, a, here's probably one of my favorite parts. He took me to <clears throat> another building and this one, it was, it was so large. It was the largest of all of them. Again, I looked down and I couldn't see anything. It looked like, have you ever seen the Acropolis in Greece where they have, um, oh, I forget the name of the building, the Parthenon. And it's, it's the one that's got the marbles in front. I saw it on the film that you talked in. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, it, it looked just like that. And it, the marbles up front, the mar marble columns, and there must have been 30 to 40 stairs. You'd have to walk up, walk up these stairs to get to the, to the front door, to where the, where the entrance was. Well, I didn't know what this building was from the outside. Well, then he took me inside and I realized it was a library. And it wasn't just a regular library. This library contained virtually everything that you would ever want to learn. Now, on the other side, there are all kinds of libraries, but there was only one of this particular type. And somebody I know, a friend of mine said, I think what you were seeing was a building on the other side called the Akishic Records. I had never heard that before, but I, I, I've heard it since then. So that may very well, very well be what it was, but it was a library. And here's the thing that was so interesting. In that library, Anything that you wanted to learn, all you had to do was think about what you wanted to learn about, and you would automatically go there. It was like thought. You would think, okay, I want to learn about what happened in World War II on Midway Island. You would go to that section of the library, and you could pull out books. So everything was in this library. Well, here's one of my favorite parts about my whole experience. On the left-hand side of this building, of this library, there are rooms. And you know what, the only thing I can equate these to is, you know, in, in a modern library we have here, they have study rooms off to the side. That's what these rooms looked like. And they were all the way down the building, as far as you could see. And I walked over and there was a, there was a woman sitting in this room in one, one of these, one of these, uh, just one of these rooms and her back was towards me and she had black jet hair, straight black hair that went down to her waist. And she was watching what looked like to what, what, what looks like now in my frame of reference would be a flat screen TV. But when I had this experience, we didn't have flat screen TVs. So I was just, I didn't know what she was watching. It just looked like a video screen. Well, what she was doing is in these libraries, you go in these rooms, you can watch living history as it actually happened. When I looked at her, my guide said, look at what she's watching. So I looked at what she was watching and she was looking at a battle that took, had taken place 200 years ago in the Plains Indian tribe, the Native American Plains Indians against the United States Cavalry. It was a battle. And I thought to myself, how is it possible that this girl can be watching something that happened in the past in real time as it actually really happened? But everything, and, and that's where I got the idea that everything is recorded. Nothing gets missed, nothing is hidden. And there's a huge, a huge part about the other side that is about learning. People want to continue learning and growing and developing. 
So that's why they have all these libraries and all these different buildings. And you can go into these places and you can watch living history. So anything you want to read about or see, you can see the Titanic, what happened. You can see um, Paris, France during World War II. You can, anything you want to learn about, you can learn. And I was just absolutely amazed by that. So that was the library. Um, oh, the next place he took me to, okay, this, was, this was another really unique looking building. From the outside, it was a circle, a very, just a gigantic, huge circular building. And it had, again, it had columns all the way around the entire circle. And what made this one unique was that it had a dome. It was a dome roof, round, again, absolutely huge. So I saw the outside and then he took me on the inside and I knew that this building was where we go to plan our lifetimes. Because we, we all plan our lives, none of our lives are accidents. There's, a, there's planning that goes into a lifetime for us. So he took me in these beautiful white marble tables everywhere. And he took me over to one and on this table were two scrolls and they were, they were wrapped up. One had a red ribbon and the other one had a blue ribbon. And these were scrolls of my lifetime, what I had chosen. And I didn't know why there were two. So I, I unraveled the blue one, I took the ribbon off and I spread out this scroll on the table. And I could see that it was written out in black pen, like calligraphy, like the kind of pens that they used back in the olden days when you'd have to take the pen, dip it into the ink and write. That's what it looked like. And when I went to try to read it, it folded back up again. So I wasn't allowed to read what I had chosen to do in this life because it might interfere with my lessons. But on that scroll, we chart everything. We chart where we're going to be born, what, school, what schools are we going to go to, what languages are you going to learn, what are you going to do for work in your life, your career, all these different things. So, and, and I don't know why we go to this building for that, but that's what we do. And we go there with our guide and we actually plan out major lessons that we want to learn. And also along with that, we also plan out trials or difficult periods to test ourselves to see how we're going to grow. Because the other side, everything is perfect. It's, it's bliss. It's absolutely full of love and compassion and acceptance. There's no negativity of any kind. So it's hard to learn a lot of lessons on the other side. There are many souls that don't come into lifetimes because they, they think it's too hard, so they stay there. But coming here, you actually experience. And when you experience things, that's how you learn. And it's almost like trying to describe to somebody what it's like to ride a bicycle. You can explain it to them, but until they actually do it, they never know what it's like. So that's one of the reasons that people come into life. And one of the hardest things that I learned is usually what a soul learns from is something that is painful. So going through a breakup or losing a loved one, some, we all have, we all face these trials. And again, it's for our learning. So earth you have to look at it like it's just a big school. You come in here to learn lessons. And in order to learn well, sometimes you have to go through things. But on the other side, what is, and that's why it's, it's something you miss so much. On the other side, there's no negativity. There's no war. There's no aging. There's no disease. There's no homelessness. There's no hunger. All of those things exist here. And we come into life to learn lessons for ourselves that we've charted. But we also come in to help 
alleviate the suffering of others. So there's really two main components as to why we come in. So those are the reasons. <clears throat> okay, I want to get you now to the next thing that they took me to. Oh, I want to say something first. <clears throat> I almost forgot. Have you ever heard the term soulmate? Yeah. They're actually real. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm and, married to it. <laughs> yeah, they're, uh, there's, there's in, inside this building where you plan your lifetime, there on the other side of this building, there are, are again, huge libraries and they're the book of life. Every person has a book of life. And my guide said, go look at your soulmate's book. And all of a sudden, when he said that, I was standing in front of a book. And you know how, when you look at the binding of a book, when it's in a bookshelf, you just see the end of it. Yeah. And a lot of times you'll see the writing that goes across the, the top. It'll say Encyclopedia Britannica, something like that. Well, each of these books has a name, but the names go down and they were in gold lettering. And my soulmate's name is Nina, N-I-N-A. And we all have one. We all have a soulmate that was created at the same time we were, who is our perfect eternal mate. I just thought that was so interesting to learn. It was, just, it was wonderful to learn that. My so husband have... was born six weeks after me in the same hospital. Really? Yeah. There you go. Perfect example. So that, that just blew me away that we all have soulmates. <clears throat> the next thing he took me to, and this was also another, it was all just so fantastic. I, I felt like I was at a Disneyland for adults so many interesting things, so much, so much fun and learning. People love to learn on the other side and you can do anything. If you want to learn to write music, you can. If you want to hike, you can do that. If you want to go swimming, you can do that. You can write poetry. And what's so interesting about the other side is that everybody has some kind of work but it's not like work here. Work on, he work on earth, you have to go to a job to pay your bills, you know, mortgage, utility, food, you have to have money to buy all that stuff. Well, on the other side, it's not like that. You don't have to have money for anything. And you do the kind of work that you love to do just because you love it. And also because God created all of us with unique and special gifts. So if someone loves to do carpentry, they can do that on the other side as much as they want. Now, is there that is, something you saw or something you were told, or is this is what you've gathered? Something I was told okay. by, by my guide. And I, I could, <clears throat> it's, it's so strange. I don't know how he did this, but as I was looking at these different buildings, I was getting all this information coming in. It was almost like I was getting my memory back about what this place is like. So the longer I was there, I started to get my memory back and started realizing, you know, this is where, this is our real home. This is where we're from. We come from here and come into a lifetime to learn. And even though our lifetime here could be 80 or 90 years for people on the other side, it seems like weeks or a month. That's why when loved ones cross over, like God forbid you lose a child or you lose a spouse, for them, it's only a matter of weeks until you're going to be there also because they don't have time. But for us, it could be 30 years. So they don't, they don't have the same emotions on the other side as we have here. We miss them terribly. But for them, the perspective is different. They can look in and see us at any time where we can't do that. So they can check in and see how we're doing. So I thought that was really just a beautiful thing to see. And the, the next thing he took me to was a castle. It, was, it looked just like a, a castle you might see in England. It was huge. 
a beautiful castle. And my guide said, everything that's on earth was first on the other side. So this castle was built on the earth from people who remembered what it was like on the other side, what castles were like. And the reason it was a castle, again, it was a, a place where you could go to learn. If you wanted to learn about a particular period in history, you can go to this place on the other side where you can actually see the buildings that represented that time in history. So that's why he took me to this castle. Again, it was just a beautiful marble, I mean, beautiful um, rock made out of rock like they were back then, castles. And I walked in and there was a beautiful red carpet all the way in the floor of this castle. And on both sides of the, of the walls, when I walked in, then this castle was huge. There were life-size paintings and the paintings were of people, the kings, the queens, the princes, the princes, princesses, everybody who lived in that castle, whatever time period for that three or 400 years, everyone who lived there, the royalty had these life-size pictures. So if you wanted to learn about King Henry VIII, for example, you could go to a castle, you could see what he looked like and the kind of clothes they wore. And here's something that really blew my mind. In front of each picture, there was a podium. And on the podium was a book. And what is in that book is about that person's life. So if you wanted to come in and learn about Queen Anne, for example, you could look at her picture, you could go to her podium, and you could read about her lifetime. And it's so detailed that conversations that she had are in this book. And these books are thick. They're, they're thick books about a whole person's lifetime. And again, it's all for learning. Well, while, while I was looking at all of this, you know how castles have those round stairways? Yeah. The, the like circular. Spiral. Yeah, yeah. I looked off to the right and there was a woman coming down that staircase. Again, she was in her thirties. She had strawberry blonde hair down to her, um, down to her shoulders. She was wearing a red kind of a gown or a tunic with a golden sash. She walked up to me. She could see me. Everybody there somehow could see me. I, I, and I, I don't know how, I guess, I don't know how that worked. But she walked up to me and she said, hi, is there anything I can help you find? And you know what I said? I said this, Yeah, I said, because I saw your show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I thought, why in the world would I say that? I, I said to her, no, thanks. I'm just looking. <laughs> How stupid. I could have asked her anything. And I, I didn't even, I didn't know it. Well, I found out that what her job is on the other side is she loves that particular period of history, the medieval time, the castles, and that's what she loves to study. So anybody who wants to learn about that time in history can go and you can see a representation of what the buildings looked like. And then you can walk in and talk to someone like her, who is an expert, what we would call a scholar on everything about that time period. And again, the whole purpose is for learning. So anytime you wanna see something unique, like a, a specific period in history, there are places on the other side where you can go and learn about that, whether it's English or, or music or languages or sports, you can go and learn about it. All right, here's the, here's the last thing that happened. After all of that, my guide took me into a field, probably the most beautiful, picturesque field you can possibly imagine. Beautiful flowers and grasses up, up to your knees, and the sun was out, and it was just a beautiful afternoon. And all of a sudden, right in front of me appeared a being, 
it turned out it was Jesus. I could see his hands. I could see he was wearing a white robe or a tunic. Everyone seems to wear tunics over there. And my guide said that's because that's what people feel the most comfortable in. But people I saw were wearing all kinds of stuff, even people wearing jeans and a t-shirt. So I, and he, was, he had a golden sash around his waist and golden sandals. And he was different than everybody else I saw. He was so bright, so much energy was coming from his, his face. It was like a huge light was turned on facing outwards and I couldn't see his face. I just knew that this was Jesus. And he spoke to me and he said, you must tell them there is no death. And right after he said that, boom, I was right back in the hospital room. And I remember asking the doctor, what just happened? And he said, we lost you there. And he said, we lost you for seven minutes. And they had to get the paddles and they had to jumpstart my heart and all that. And I, I could not believe what had just happened. I only realized what happened about a day or two after I got home. And I talked to my mom about this. And there were no books about people's near-death experiences, really. But my mom read a book by Raymond Moody. And it, I think it was called Life After Life. And that's how she was able to share with me what she thought happened. Well, once I realized, and this, this was something that was really hard for me to deal with. You know how you, you hear about some people's NDEs where they're given a choice? Do you want to stay or do you want to go back? Right. They didn't give me that choice. And I think the reason was because I would have wanted to stay there. But he told me, you must tell them there is no death. And what that meant was your job, your career, your life is about, you're supposed to tell people now what you saw. You were given this amazing opportunity to see these things that, that are on the other side, that life is eternal. Nobody really dies. We just go to a different place. That's our home. So ever since then, I've been trying to tell people exactly what I saw in the first um, what year was your NDE. You know what? I don't know what year it was, but I was 21 and I'm 56 now. And the thing that's so interesting is people used to ask me, or they still ask me now, did you get any particular gifts when you came back? Like, were you psychic or could you see your guide? And I didn't, I didn't have anything. The only thing I got was 100% complete recall of everything I saw. And it's all in perfect memory. What people said to me, what I could see, the buildings, everything I had complete recall for. But when I got back, I remember I went through the worst depression of my life because I realized this isn't our home. This earth experience isn't home for us. The other side is so infinitely much better and happier and peaceful and loving. I wanted to be back there, but I realized that I have to finish my lifetime, that I was given an assignment. You must tell them there is no death. So ever since then, I've been telling people and I, I would always just tell people that I knew because we didn't have the internet back then, didn't have computers, right. none of that was back then. And the only, in just a couple of years ago was the first time where I had the idea, why don't I put my story on Facebook and I'll try to help people that way, try to share my story. And ever since then, I've been sharing my story to larger audiences. And I am so fortunate I feel so privileged that what I saw is able to help other people. It's the most gratifying feeling I've, I've ever experienced. I know. It's just, and it's just been a wonderful, wonderful experience sharing it with people like, like with you and being on your show. I have so much fun sharing my story. 
The reason why I asked, do you know what year it was? Because my second NDE was, I was 25 and it was 1986. And, and I'm thinking, because my very first moment in the bright white light, I was alone and I was thinking, God, you, you need to start sending people back to let them know this is real. And then yeah. you had that experience. It sounds like within a few years, maybe of mine, and you're sent back and told to, to tell people there's no death. Yep. And, um, and you're so fortunate as you, I'm sure you realize that it was a couple of weeks after your NDE, you was able to tell your mom and somebody that happened to know what this was. Mm -hmm. And that was like rare in that time in the oh, 80s, yeah. because even though Raymond Moody's book was out in like 75, even 10 years later, who heard of that? Mm -hmm. Not most people. Exactly. And not until we got the Internet and was able to start using it, you know, like you say, Facebook and things were we really able to put names to things and start to see the research and realize we're not alone. Yep. And you're so fortunate too, that yours was documented. I mean, doctors saw you were gone and said how long you was gone and you know that yep. you were gone. So somebody can't say, well, you hallucinated. You probably weren't really dead. No, you were. I mean, you have proof that you were dead. And so, yep. cause there's so many questions surrounding our NDEs, you know, when we're thinking, was this real? What about that? Now, I think on the film, I heard you say something like, um, maybe I'm wrong remembering, um, that we don't reincarnate until all of our family. That's is, true. What, yep. What was that? Yeah, everybody who was in your lifetime with you, family, friends, siblings, everybody who's in your life, when they cross over, nobody goes anywhere until you get back because they want to have those reunions, those parties, because it is such a huge deal to survive this planet. So if you, your spouse crosses over, you have 30 more years left of your life, for example, your spouse in that in this lifetime, he's going to still be on the other side when you cross over, because for him, it's only been like a month since he's been there. And lifetimes take, they take a long time to plan out. There is a lot of detail that goes into a lifetime. And people who we knew in our lifetimes just want to stay there until you, they can greet you again. So they, they stay, they don't go anywhere yet. What I love about your story is that it coincides with everything I have come to know to be true. Oh, good. You know, and the reincarnation, I was like on the fence, but yet what you're saying, I can conceive of, like, if we are, then it's our choice. It's something we planned. Yep. And, you know, I'm sure we still have free will. Yes. And it's not like, well, um, something bad happens to me. Well, it's my fault because I planned it. You know what I mean? Because there's other people coming in with their free mm -hmm. will. And, you know, because I, exactly. I really have trouble when people kind of like excuse for no compassion for people. Well, you, it was planned. You planned it. So who cares? You know, and yeah, then if you die, well, so what? You know, we don't die, you know. And so but everything you said coincide with yeah. everything, the conclusions I've come to myself. Um, yeah, and like, also I feel like listen to you that that must be why when we've been on the other side, we have this feeling and we don't know why we want to write a book. We hope to see that our life on a big screen, on a movie theater, we, we just have this drive. And, you know, I was the most, I say I was the most unlikely author, even though I'd went through college I really struggled with writing and spelling and grammar and all those things. Well, luckily there's such yeah. things as editor, which I yeah. didn't know. I just started writing one day and then I found out, Oh, you got to get an editor. Okay. So anybody can write a book. It doesn't matter if you don't know how to spell or all those other things. And yeah. then also too, um, you know, I drowned at five and then had my ectopic pregnancy at 25, my NDEs. And, and so um, for some reason, I never knew why, I hated the nonfiction. I mean, I hated the fiction section. Like oh. I, w I had to have true stories. If it wasn't a true story, keep it away from me. I want nothing to do with it. And then what you're saying, like the, the records 
and how you could just watch something and it and it'd be a movie and um coincides also with um even when I drowned when I was five, the first thing that happened was a vision opened up and it was a memory. And it was like I was reliving that memory. And that memory of looking to this fishbowl taught me these fish, you know, where I drowned, they knew something yeah. I didn't that I was dead. Because I was like, why are these fish aren't afraid of me? And then this opened up and it showed me. And I had wow. said before that it seems to me like God is the best um movie maker in the world because we had we get these visions and yes. i think i heard you say on your film that um you didn't come back with gifts like a lot of us do yep that's true i didn't come back with anything other than memory yeah and i think your memory is the gift you know because it's so yeah. different than everybody's and it's so detailed and it kind of to me it takes all of these stories it's like a summary at the end of a book say all of our ndes is these little chapters and yours is like the summary it like puts it all together in a picture that we can hmm. see um, that's good i'm so glad you said that yeah now um did you go through tunnel and is that where the life review stuff started was that no, like after i i um that whole characteristic of a person who has a near-death experience i'm i missed all of that for some reason and i don't know why i didn't see my body i wasn't out I, I wasn't looking down at the scene i didn't see the tunnel i didn't have the white light experience i was it was like i was placed on the other side of the white light so the white light is the light from the other side that shines into these tunnels it's kind of like a beacon when someone dies on earth and their soul gets out of their body that light at the end is what summons it's it draws them to the other side and the other side also they always send someone to get us nobody nobody dies by themselves there's always someone they send to us usually a family member or someone who crossed before us but somehow I missed that. And I was just on the other side of the light in the orientation center. So when somebody sees that white light in the tunnel and they walk down the tunnel and they cross into that light, that's where I was. I was on the other, other, on the other side of that light. And I, I, to this day, I don't know why I had the experience that I did. So much detail, so much information that I was able to bring back and to share. So Does I'm, it explain I'm just, what the light is? The light, it's like if you were in a dark room, like in your bedroom and the lights I are mean, off. I was in the white light, but I mean, I didn't know if somebody said this is what the light is or represents or. Yeah. Yeah. The, the light is just the light that shines into the tunnel, the natural light from the other side. And that draws you. And that, that I didn't and my guide didn't tell me that I just I just knew that that light is the light that comes from the orientation center it leads people it guides people down the tunnel so when they walk into that light when they get through it they're like that gentleman who had a heart attack you walk right into it and you're in the orientation center you know I think the white light is I think it's God's eye yeah, it, it could it could be that. You know, Absolutely. they say something about like our eyes. There's something light that you know comes through. You know that how is how we see, and I just feel like it's light's eye upon God's light upon us. You definitely feel God. We don't feel that feeling here on the earth, but on the other side, and when you're in that light, you feel the presence of God. And you feel how much love he has for you. you. You really feel how much he cherishes you. And he loves all of us. And it's the most, I think that was the hardest part is coming back from that feeling. Because we don't have that here on earth. And I think we long for that while we're here. We don't know what it is, but there's this longing that you want to feel the love of God. Absolute joy and happiness and no more pain all of your life experiences you keep with you but the painful ones are washed away it's like you're free 
Um, people who die from cancer, for example, they don't have pain when they cross over. Their bodies don't have pain over there. And I just, I just can't wait until it's my time to go. We have so much to look forward to. And I just don't know why we decide to reincarnate, like curiosity killed a cat, you know, yeah. like, you know, like just be happy where you are. Don't come back here. Yeah. <laughs> don't absolutely. try to learn. Stay dumb. Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. That's funny. I mean, I can see like when you're planning your life, like if you're given the understanding, if you do this and if you stay on the path and we will help you on that path, you will make this big difference. You know, whether somebody sent to cure cancer or blindness or stop a war or um, love a child that doesn't have love, you know, whatever a purpose can mean. And I could see where we would have the courage and sign up for that. But yeah, man, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, because because on the other side, you have much more courage because you realize I'm going to come into this life. It's not going to be very long. Even if it's 70 years, it's not going to feel like that. But then when you get down here, that's when the hard work starts because you don't think about it. On the other side, you think this is eternal home. I can have as many lifetimes as I want. I can have zero or I can have hundreds. It's totally up to the individual if they want to come in for a lifetime. But on the other, on the other side, you are braver because I, I think to myself, there are things I've been through in this life that. I don't think I would ever have wanted to go through, but I learned from them. And we do seem to learn the most from the hardships that we go through. Yeah. yeah. My heart just breaks for people that are in severe pain, you know, oh, yeah. like, and, and like laying somewhere and they don't have help, you know, get dismembered, you know what I mean? And they, they have to go through such misery and pain or starvation. Yes. Um, yep. you know, any kind of abuse, like as a, as a prisoner of war, you know, just such pain and agony is just really hard to fathom why that would be necessary or why God would allow it, you know, those kind of things. Oh, I've thought about all those questions and I, I have more questions still to this day that I want to know. And I, I watch people's NDE stories all the time. I love reading those stories because they remind me of mine. Yeah. Yeah. There's always some similarity, even though they're mm -hmm. so different. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, those visions that open up and show us things that you saw, you know, as, oh, I meant to ask you when you saw your life review and you was in like this circle and yeah. were all those playing your life yeah. stories at the same time and you could yeah, comprehend. Was, yeah. So I could, I could look, I could turn in a, in a literal circle 360 degrees and I could look at every screen and it was plain aspects of my life that I could look at. I would, I imagine you can probably stop and just look at one for a while, but everything was going so quickly that he just showed me a panorama of what it's like when you get back and have a life review. My life review was me showing God the abuse I went through and it just came out like this loud screen. And then it oh, was just really? like, somebody could radio or a record player and put it on full speed, like real fast. Like it's over oh, like yeah. that, like that dirtiness, that badness, that horrible stuff that happened to me couldn't be in this beautiful white space. It was like, it's done. God, no, stop. You know? Yeah. Wow. And, and I think too, we are short on time. Like you were there, um, seven minutes and you say it felt like an hour. Mm -hmm. I was probably there half a minute and it seemed like a half hour. And it's so really? strange too, how, time is different no matter how long we were physically dead how time now my drowning it seemed like i don't know i could probably go as far as between a half hour and an hour because i was oh out of God. body i was doing stuff flying around being a ghost kid and all that there was no tunnel in heaven it was it was all out of body ghost stuff but voice was coming in like and i had uh, heard an angel and things and voices come and tell me. And I know what you mean by the knowing, like all of a sudden, like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I get it. Yeah, exactly. And so That's wonderful. 
but yeah, your story just puts so much in perspective. I think, like I say, it's just like all of our stories are these chapters and yours is like the conclusion. And it's like, um, we all have these pieces and they're all so different, but yours just, it just fits with all the conclusions I've come to. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad because I, I love sharing it. And I hope your I hope your audience gets as much out of it as as I love sharing it. And I was oh, shocked I hadn't heard yours before. And if anybody if anybody has questions they want to ask me, they can they can email me, they can Facebook me, any and all I'm happy to talk to anybody about it. I wish I was a movie director. I would just make indie movies constantly. Because I, mean, <laughs> yeah. I would love to put you know, visual, the actual visual, not a fake visual. You know how they change things. Yeah. And, and it's not like even a guy uh, made a movie uh, for me, not a movie. It's a film, you know, Peggy Robbins is into East part one, part two. Yeah. It's on YouTube, yeah. but still he picked these pictures and I saw them later and he's like, it's fine. I'm like, yeah, but you know, it wasn't how I saw it, you know, exactly. I wish, yeah. And I, I wish if I could draw or paint yeah. what those tunnels looked like in the orientation center. That was, it was absolutely beautiful what that building looked like. And when you come back from a lifetime, it's such a huge deal when you come back. Maybe someday I can find an artist who could paint what it really looked like. And you know, uh, it's funny you said that about the castle because I have been trying to turn my house into a castle. <laughs> it oh. don't look like it but in my mind i go sit and draw draw house plans and i'm trying to make it look like a castle on a budget <laughs> yeah. and because i just can see these these walls and these towers and these tunnels and and i have no idea why it's just like it's something it's just like pushing in me it's like this is going to end up looking like castle not that i care to have this expensive home pay a lot of taxes or anything it's just it's like this art inside yeah. of me that I, I'm just, I have to do it. <laughs> it's wonderful. Something to do. <laughs> Peggy, tell me, tell me, you, you said, you said earlier, and let me know if you don't want to talk about it, but That's fine. what, what happened to your husband? Um, for the last five years, he's been going to the doctor and he's had, um, this cough and a um, lot of phlegm and it comes and goes. And, um, she's just, they just gave him, um, over-the-counter phlegm medicine, an inhaler, um, an antibiotic, and um, it got worse in the last few months, quite a bit worse. And so um, he's been out of work. So we had to wait till January 1st to get his insurance back. But as soon as we got it, we got the appointment. We wanted to get a, a appointment with a pulmonary doctor right off the bat, but you have to see your regular doctor first. But yeah. we just called him and said, hey, we don't really need an appointment. We just need a referral pulmonary. And so we got in, she got us in pulmonary. And that day we were in pulmonary. Um, they did a pulmonary function test. And we went to Kroger's, we're shopping, my husband's in the bathroom. And he come back and he's laughing because that's my husband's personality. And I'm standing by the meat department and he's laughing. And he said, I have COPD. He's never smoked a day in his life. I have COPD and I have 25% oh. of my lungs left. Really? And I'm standing there thinking, I'm in Kroger's and I'm hearing this and I'm like, get me out of this store. And so he said, he seen I was upset. He said, well, maybe I heard wrong. Maybe she meant I only, I only lost 25. Maybe I'll have 75. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. in my heart, I don't think so. So we called her the next day and I recorded on my phone. So we knew everything she said and didn't miss it because I tend to go numb on bad news. Oh, yeah. And, and um, so they did a blood test and he has the kind that's hereditary. His mom had it, which at the doctor's office, I told the pulmonary doctor's office, I told her first visit, I said, his mom told me on her deathbed that my husband, her son has the same thing that she has because that's how he was presenting his cough and things at the time was how she started out. She never smoked either. And I said, oh, no, he doesn't, because I don't believe that, because I was really scared back then even what is going on with him. But like, say it would go away. And um, so, but like I say, it come back this time, and it just was scaring me. It got worse. Yeah. And so, so he's looking at lung transplant is his only option. But because it's hereditary, it only 
3% of COPD is hereditary and his is. So now his kids have to get tested and his grandchildren, his siblings to see if they have oh. it. Because if anybody um, has, they actually said everybody should be tested because you won't know it. And then, you know, now he is 25% left, but there's something you can do if you catch it early. And if you get tested and you find out this runs in your family, um, there's protein injections that will slow it down. So he'll be on protein injections now once a week, rest of his life. Oh, that's because good, it's then. something you're inherited with that it doesn't, your body doesn't produce this protein. And it, um, in your 20s to 40s, are in there. And sometimes even little ones, the babies can get this. It can start sooner. Oh, really? And it, like, it attacks your lungs, your liver, and your skin. And it, so far, his liver's good. So that's good. His skin's fine. Oh, good. But so, but yeah, but he's not going to do a lung transplant. Wow. So. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. So, but that I've read on online, somebody said, well, I've had 22% for years and I'm fine. And he's, he functions fine. Oh, uh, he got on uh, steroid and inhalers and a mist and a nebulizer and he's feeling good. He just has to take it easy. He is forced to retire and go on disability. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was like one day change your life. Wow. And I, cause the next day we called her, I said, now is he supposed to quit work and go on disability? She's absolutely. So we already got a little paperwork started. So, but he's wow. been the company 36 years. So, you know, we're fine, but. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. I mean, he's my honey. <laughs> yeah. You know, yep. really. Is, is, I mean, we're always close, but it's just made us closer. Yeah, absolutely. I agree to just appreciate every day and every moment that you are together because it's not promised. That's and, true. You know, and if I had to choose, you know, if you do choose these things, I would choose to know way in advance. I would not want the shock and surprise and, you know, devastation. So. Oh, I, I know. Yeah. I don't either. That does, that scares me too. Well, Peggy, my, my um, laptop is about to stop. Okay. I think my I think it's my battery. Okay, I well, thank you. I just get run in the mouth. And <laughs> I do. I do too. So, I, know, I just did, I just didn't want to all of a sudden go off without saying bye. Well, um, I will have this uploaded tonight, and I will send you the link as the moment it's published. Okay. Thank it was you. so nice to meet you. You too. I'll talk bye -bye. to you later. Okay. All right. Bye bye. bye, -bye.